Good evening and welcome to the second annual Bio EOMBC Biotech Forum. I'm uh, Tony Moreira, Vice Provost for uh, Academic Affairs and Professor of uh, Chemical and Biochemical Engineering. And we are very happy to have so many of you joining us tonight uh, to discuss opportunities that exist within biotechnology today. We are very pleased to have Congressman Jim Greenwood with us uh, leading the discussion uh, on this topic. Uh, before we uh, get into the program, I'd like to recognize a few uh, UMBC leaders that will be with us tonight. Uh, our president, Freeman Nowowski, uh, very back of the room. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, our Chief Officer, John Martello, uh, who is our uh, president and CEO of the UMBC Training Centers and Vice Provost for uh, uh, Continuing Professional Studies. In the back as well. I see Greg Simmons, our Vice President for Institutional Advancement. Uh, Dr. Jeff Summers, up front, uh, our Vice President for Research. Uh, I also saw uh, our Dean of uh, College of Natural and Mathematical Sciences. And we have many other uh, UMBC uh, community uh, people uh, around, so they all have their UMBC name tags, and please feel free to. Uh, and walk up to them up and ask any questions about uh, any of our programs. We are very pleased again that you are with us uh, tonight. I'd also like to recognize uh, our advisory board members for the biotech programs at UNBC. I will not go through the names, but they are sitting right here at our, at our table. And also recognize uh, all of those that have been our supporters and sponsors for this program. Uh, Battelle, Medimmune, Human Genome Sciences, Shepard Mullen, Martech Biosciences, Blackton Dickinson, MD Bio, the Mellon Biotechnology Center, So Ewing, Women in Bio, and the Greater Baltimore Technology Council. Thank you very much for your support of our programs. We really appreciate it. <laughs> this academic year has been already an extraordinary year for UMBC. From our recognition by the U.S. News and World Report as the number one university among up and coming national universities, and with Stanford being number four uh, in our commitment to undergraduate teaching, uh, also to the selection of our president as the one of the top ten best country uh, presidents, college presidents. Again, thank you very much, Freeman. Congratulations. <laughs> So UABC continues to be on the path to excellence and the path to value. The biosciences represent a vital component of our strength in the sciences. Uh, and just to give you a few examples of the kinds of programs we have and the kinds of achievements we have made over the years, we have a strong foundation in core academic degree programs in chemistry, biochemistry, biological sciences, chemical and biochemical engineering. In our this foundation, we have applied programs in, in a variety of areas, including electrobiology, biochemistry, bioinformatics, uh, environmental engineering, biomechanics, just to give you some examples. Our research is strong in life sciences, and also our en enrollments, our undergraduate enrollments in all of these programs are, are flourishing and, and increasing over the last five years at phenomenal rates. Our programs offer hands-on experience through research opportunities, internships, and creative learning. We have one of only two Howard Dukes Medical Institute investigators at the public university in Maryland. And our science and engineering faculty continue to attract major grants uh, from uh, uh, the national uh, funding agencies and NSF has recognized many of them as outstanding young researcher awardees. Also, our undergraduate students continue to excel and do well and, and receive uh, excellent uh, career opportunities. Uh, just to get as one example, our undergraduate students uh, that formed the Biodiesel Club uh, received the top uh, prize in the MTV Green Do Doing Challenge. Again, a national or international competition uh, dealing with the environmental sustainability. So, very, again, very, very glad to see such, such accomplishments. We're also making strong contributions to workforce and economic development in the region through our research part, BW Tech at UMBC. Uh, it has attracted uh, over 50 companies, creating over a thousand uh, jobs in, in the region. Uh, most of these companies that have been launched 
stay in Maryland and continue to be uh, providing jobs and, uh, and uh, research opportunities and new products, opportunities for, for the state. Tonight's forum is going to be focused specifically on our applied biotechnology programs. These include our Master's in Professional uh, Studies in Biotechnology, the Master of Science in Applied Molecular Biology, and our Certificates in Biotechnology Management and Biochemical Regulatory Engineering. Uh, the MPS program in biotechnology recognizes the link and the connection between the sciences and the business and the management skills necessary uh, to grow and develop uh, a company uh, in biotechnology. We develop our programs working together with industry and the uh, Food and Drug Administration. We, we, we build focus groups that help us design these programs and make sure that they meet the needs of the, uh, of the field. And, and we continue to have an advisory board that supports our programs and continues to provide us advice uh, in making sure again that we are uh, up to date and, and, and meaningful for career opportunities in, in biotechnology. Should I receive today a folder uh, in the inside which you will find information about our speaker, an overview of bioscience at UNBC, and also fly from bio on their public campaign uh, in biotechnology, as well as an evaluation for tonight's event. And this is the evaluation form that uh, you may, uh, may see in your folders. We encourage you to take a few minutes to, to complete this, uh, this survey. Uh, again, it's important for us to, to get your feedback and the, and the advice as well. Uh, as you turn your survey in, as a talk of our appreciation, uh, you will receive a reusable grocery bag uh, as a representation of our campus commitment to environmental sustainability. So make sure you do that. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, introduce our speaker for the, for the evening. And uh, it is certainly my honor, my pleasure, to introduce Congressman Jim Greenwood. Uh, Jim is President and CEO of BIO, the Biotechnology Industry Organization in Washington, D.C., which represents over 1,200 uh, biotechnology companies, academic institutions, and state biotechnology centers. Uh, across the United States and many, many countries internationally, over 30 nations. <coughs> Since his appointment as CEO and President of BIO, he has, in 2005, he has made market improvements in, 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 in BIO uh, and he has increased its staff and its budget by, by nearly 50%. BIO is now a world-class advocacy organization playing a leading role shaping public policy on a variety of fronts critical to the success of the biotechnology industry at both the state and national levels uh, and the international. Mr. Greenwood was a representative uh, for Pennsylvania's 8th District in the U.S. House of Representatives from January 1993 to uh, 2005 and was a senior member of the Energy and Commerce Committee where he was widely viewed as a leader on healthcare and the environment. I came to, to meet uh, Congressman Greenwood in late 2004. At that time, he was uh, starting his appointment as, as current position as President and CEO of BIO. And I was the chair of the Council of Biotechnology Centers, and actually was transitioning out of my term as, as chairman. And so I worked with, with, uh, with Jim and uh, my successor as chair of the CBC in all the transition and all the, uh, the, the, the evolution of both the CDC and the bio organization. From day one, I was highly impressed by his understanding of the, the role that academia plays in biotechnology. Jim knows that uh, it is in the academic, academia where ideas are formed that are the source of many of the companies, the emerging biotechnology companies that are vital and are the bedrock of the biotech. Jim is also committed to making sure that and biotechnology is understood at all levels and is committed to uh, assuring that there is a pipeline to biotechnology by supporting uh, education and, and ideas and vision for the middle and high school pipeline for biotechnology students of the future. So we were delighted back in 2004 that Jim became the CEO of Bio and it has been a pleasure to work with him since then and see the evolution of the biotechnology the industry organization as the leading advocacy group for our industry. So without further ado, let me again welcome Congressman Jim Greenwood. Well, good evening. Thank you, 
you, Dr. Maria. I want to thank uh, Dr. Lebowski. Is he still here? Um, I think probably I, I didn't know much about this place until I got here, and I, I think I've discovered what your real weakness is. is your president is just too introverted and shy and retired. And just can't, he just has a hard time drumming up any, any enthusiasm about this place at all. He's actually he's a, he's a huge dynamo, and uh, he's got, already got me. Um, I think I'm going to be wearing school colors tomorrow and take my pom poms down to Washington. Anyway, UMBC. It's a pretty, pretty impressive place. Thank you, Dr. Wolf, as well, and I want to appreciate, uh, appreciate UMBC hosting this forum. It's a fairly unique forum. I speak around the country, but it's usually to uh, our affiliate organizations, so it's pretty impressive. Uh, we were talking about this at, we had a little dinner before, and that, uh, on a Wednesday night, so many of you would come out here and, uh, uh, and, and take an interest in this, in this subject. I don't know whether it's a slow night on television or not, but, uh, but what I want to do is I want to talk to you about um, about what biotechnology is, uh, and and um, specifically as the as the uh, title suggests, um, we at Bio uh, have um, low aspirations. All we want to do is, is heal the world, and fuel the world, and feed the world, and um, we've actually taken a, a little bit of criticism for actually being so grandiose in our aspirations, but um, I, I did not leave the Congress uh, uh, easily. Um, most members of Congress uh, leave because they get carried out in a pine box, um, because they lose an election, because they get perp walked out in handcuffs. Um, but uh, most of us don't leave voluntarily. And, and, and the reason I did leave voluntarily uh, is, became, is because I became uh, convinced that biotechnology is the most transformational human endeavor ever. And that it is doing already and will, um, by leaps and bounds, continue to change uh, life uh, on planet Earth for the better in a variety of ways. So I want to talk to you about that. I want to talk to you about the opportunities for careers. I know that some of you are already have careers in biotechnology. Others of you are contemplating careers. But I think it is, it, it is, it is um, among the most psychically and financially rewarding career opportunities you can have, and I'd like to respond um, to your questions. Um, as Dr. Maria said, the, the biotechnology industry was born and continues to be renewed by strong research universities like those in the University of Maryland system. Very often, biotechnology startup companies are formed by university researchers and founded, founded to commercialize university research. I don't have to tell you that there. I stood on the roof with uh, Dr. Grabowski and looked over at the companies that have been spun out uh, from this university already. But not only do research universities generate new startup companies, they also continue to educate and inspire the workforce that enables those companies to grow and expand. UMBC, UMBC fulfills both its research and teaching roles with excellence. You fight above your weight here and fight very effectively. When the U.S. News and World Report recognized UMBC as the number one up-and-coming university, the report specifically cited UMBC's commitment to involving students in research early on, what President Lebowski calls the UMBC way. UMBC biotech students working at the NIH, regional university and hospital laboratories, and at companies like MedImmune, Baxter, Healthcare, Reliant, BioReliance, and others are gaining real-world experience that will well serve them and their future employees. So what is biotechnology? And again, it's a little tricky because some of you are, you know, 10 times more about what biotechnology is than I will ever know. And some of you um, may actually may be one person who knows less of that in this room than I do. I am not a, uh, a scientist. Um, there's a definition that we use. It's the use of living organisms or parts thereof to provide useful products, processes, and services where cells are the basic um, building blocks of living organisms. So, Biotechnology scientists modify cellular DNA to produce useful proteins and, and other molecules. Uh, since I'm not a scientist, I've had to sort of get my head around this in my own way, try to understand what, what, what this means in terms of the course of, of human history. When I was um, uh, still a member of Congress and I was applying for the job as President and CEO of Bio, I had a meeting with the search committee, the subsection of the board of the, the directors of Bio, and uh, they, they basically said to me, look, we're looking for somebody who uh, has some management skills, as a member of Congress, you manage staff, you the chair of the committee, and so forth, I think you can do that. Uh, we're looking for someone who knows, understands the political and the legislative process, obviously, you've been doing that for 24 years, and you can 
think you can handle that. You're looking for somebody to interface with the media. You've been doing that as a politician. But the, the thing we really want to know is, do you have a passion for biotechnology? So I said, well, um, uh, I've been thinking about that uh, all night, um, primarily because the headhunter told me you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, I was lying awake at 3 o'clock in the morning trying to figure out how I would answer that question and, and answer it in a way that, that was real to me. And so I said, what I'm about to say probably sounds like what somebody would come up with at 3 o'clock in the morning, but it goes like this. And, and, and what I thought, and what I continue to think is that uh, what biotechnology is about is this. It, it, in, in the four billion years that have uh, elapsed since the first self-replicating cell uh, occurred in the primordial soup at the, at the dawn of, of creation of life on this planet, in, in, in all of that time, um, we have evolved and our DNA has evolved to the point where here we are as human beings and we have these huge brains and we have this, uh, these manipulative hands with opposing thumbs and we have tremendous perceptions of sight and, 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 and all of the rest of our perceptions. We, we're at a point where we can literally reach into our body, pull out our DNA, put it under the microscope, and from what we learn, we prevent a couple from burying its child. And from what we learn, we prevent a man from waking up one morning and turning to his wife of 60 years and asking, who are you? Uh, and, and that's a pretty cool thing to do. And you know, Darwinian uh, evolution will eventually uh, have its way of, um, of weeding out uh, genetic defects. And those of human species who uh, aren't as well equipped to survive because of genetic mutations and defects um, uh, left to their own devices will get weaned out of the gene pool. Um, but we, at this point in our, in our history, are too sensitive to let our children and our loved ones die um, because of their of, of genetic um, mutations. And so what we in biotechnology want to do is outrun Darwin and try to figure out how do we take this incredible knowledge, in fact, all of the knowledge uh, in, in the, in the, on the planet is really in the DNA of, of plants and animals. And to the extent that it's, it's in computers and libraries, it's because our DNA figured it, taught us how to put it there. So um, to, to, to take that incredible knowledge and then apply it to reduce human suffering uh, and reduce um, uh, premature deaths uh, is really an extraordinary opportunity. It's, it's a matter of, uh, of, of a level of self-reflection of the human species, uh, understanding ourselves and applying that knowledge that, that's um, extraordinary. And it applies not only to the reason that we talk about healing uh, the world and feeding the world and fueling the world is because not only are we able to take this incredible knowledge on a daily basis as we learn more and more and apply it to to, to, to healing, to the medical arts, um, but we what we learn from about plant biotechnology enables us to expand the productivity of farmers, uh, which we absolutely have to do because um, of, of the level of hunger and starvation on this planet. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and we need to produce, we need to increase the productivity of our farmers. And if we're going to live sustainably on this planet, we have to figure out how to make fuels and products. Uh, and materials that, that are environmentally sustainable, and it will be biotechnology, I think only biotechnology, that will enable us to do that. Um, so for those of you who are less familiar with, with the history of biotechnology, some people mark uh, the beginning um, with the, the first um, recombinant um, insulin. 24 million Americans suffer from diabetes because um, their pancreases don't produce insulin. Uh, and beginning in the 1920s, uh, so scientists and medical technicians learned how to take insulin from uh, pigs and cows. And they literally went to abattoirs, to slaughter uh, houses, and gathered uh, the materials and used it to make insulin to keep diabetics alive. The problem is that um, because it is not human material, it, it, it had uh, adverse side effects. So the first, 1982, um, the first biotech product um, was human insulin, and what happened is the scientists figured out of the 25,000 or so genes in the human body, which gene it is that, that, that produces insulin, snipped that, uh, that little uh, genetic sequence uh, from, a, from a human cell, implanted it, inserted it into the, into the genome of a bacteria, and lo and behold, as if you would put a, a, a CD into a, a player, that bacteria starts making uh, human insulin, which then can be 
um, um, sorted out and, and from those cells and injected into human beings, and, and that was the beginning of biotechnology. One of the more interesting and colorful stories I learned about this process of recombinant DNA was a story told to me when I was visiting Sorono uh, in Switzerland. Um, there are uh, many women on the planet who uh, are, have been unable historically to bear children because um, their ovaries, they have, they have perfectly good eggs in their ovaries, but they lack, because of a genetic mutation, they lack uh, the, the ability to produce an enzyme which, which causes their ovaries to ovulate, to send that, that egg down the fallopian tube in, into the uterus. And so um, scientists at Serono, back, way back in the 1890s, uh, discovered that, um, the, the natural hormone, uh, which can be used to, to synthesize a treatment against female um, infertility. Now it turns out that when women become menopausal, it's not because they stop producing this enzyme that causes ovulation, but it's because the enzyme is just passed out of their bodies in their urine, uh, and so therefore it's not available to cause the ovaries to ovulate. So Serrano figured out that, um, well gee, if we could um, collect the urine from menopausal women, we could probably extract that, um, I'm glad we're having this conversation after dinner. Um, <laughs> we could probably extract that enzyme uh, and, uh, and, and use it to help these women to, to, to ovulate. Um, the next question arose was, where on earth are we going to get um, women, uh, menopausal women, to donate their, their urine? Um, the answer was at nunneries. Uh, and this was an Italian company, and they found, after asking, that um, menopausal nuns, and the nunneries were full of, full of menopausal nuns, um, would be more happy, they, they uh, because of their vows of chastity, never were children of their own, but they loved the idea of, of helping other women bring new souls to, uh, to the earth. And so uh, they readily uh, agreed to collect their urine, and uh, the Serrano trucks would come by, nunnery after nunnery, and collect the urine and take it to the factory. Um, after some unfortunate truck accidents, they decided that um, maybe there was a better way to do this. Um, and in fact, what they did is they, they identified a particular uh, gene that produces this enzyme, uh, inserted into a Chinese hamster ovary cell, and, uh, and that Chinese hamster ovary cell that began to produce that enzyme. And so if you go over to, to Basel right now, and there are bioreactors that are sitting there all day long producing um, this recombinant product, this, this protein. And uh, as a result of that, there are uh, thousands and thousands of uh, women walking around, who are, or people walking around who have been born as, as a result of that. Um, I am the president and CEO of Bio. What we are all about, and as, as Dr. Price said, is we're the, the, the National and International Trade Association for Biotechnology. We do two fundamental things. Um, we, I, we develop policy that we think is advantageous to the, to the success of biotechnology companies. It doesn't matter how good your science is, and it doesn't matter how good your entrepreneurial skills are, uh, if the uh, policy environment in which we exist is not conducive to the success of biotechnology enterprises, then they will not succeed. So it's our function to understand what kind of policy will help the companies to succeed and then advocate that policy, um, lobby for that policy and before the Congress, before the executive branch of the federal government, before the states and around the world, and we do that. We do that pretty effectively. Of course, right now we are up to our gills in the health care reform debate. Uh, what, the, what the President and the Congress appropriately want to do is to figure out how to extend our health care system to the 40-some million people in this country who don't have access to it. Uh, that's a noble thing and, and it's important to get that done. There is a tendency among the policymakers to say, well, gee, uh, if, we, if we want to get health care to everybody, we've got to make it less expensive. If we've got to make it less expensive, we have to control costs. So let's figure out how to put price controls on, among other things, uh, drugs and biologics. What we keep reminding uh, the members of Congress is that, is that there are four things we want from a good health care system. We want access for everyone. We want cost control, which is the Congress is, is focused on right now. We want the best quality in the world. We want to make sure that cost control doesn't diminish quality. But we want and we need innovation. And, and so we're the voice that says innovation is, the, is, the, is, is critical to the future of health care. And if you just focus on cost cutting, um, sure, you can you could price control our way to having drugs at 25 percent 
uh, cost reduction from where they are now. What you would end up with the result of that is today's drugs available for the foreseeable future at a slight discount and no new drugs uh, to, to uh, come about in the future because we, we've, we've choked off the R&D capabilities of the private sector. And it's the private sector uh, that produces all of these products. The other thing we do is we do um, uh, partnering meetings, we do uh, business development, we hold meetings where we invite, invite biotech companies, usually smaller bi emerging biotech companies together with investors and the biotech companies get to present a lot of their data, try to get investors interested in investing in those companies. And we hold partnering meetings where we bring big pharma together with emerging biotech companies so that they can work out collaborations and licensing schemes and so forth so that they can work together and get some synergy. Well, we have an annual uh, convention, some of you have probably been to it, it will be in Chicago this year, I'll mention that a little bit later. When we have our annual meeting, we'll get somewhere close to 20,000 people from around the world there, and in, these, in, the, in the business uh, development part of the meeting, in the partnering session, we'll put together 14,000 one-on-one meetings that we schedule with our software over the course of two or three days, and that is a tremendous opportunity for people from all over the world to get together and collaborate and create whole new, uh, whole new ventures. Uh, we need, um, uh, all of you, we need the best minds in the country to, to uh, engage in this activity. Um, on the health side, um, we've made a lot of progress. We have 250 approved biotech medicines uh, fighting cancer and cardiovascular disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, HIV, Parkinson's, cystic fibrosis. We have 600 more uh, biotech medicines in development in the pipeline right now against infectious disease, eye conditions, digestive disorders growth disorders, neurological diseases, skin disorders, and blood disorders. There's no end to um, the need. Um, there are literally thousands of diseases for which is, across the planet for which there are not effective treatments and cures right now. And so um, the, the work is, um, there's much work to be done. Um, we're already doing pretty well. Um, we have uh, a host of products uh, like those listed here. Um, against diseases like arthritis, and Crohn's disease, and these, are the, these are the big biotech drugs that are uh, changing, uh, that, have, that have kept people alive, that have changed their lives, the quality of their lives uh, in, a, in dramatic fashion. Um, uh, a recent example was uh, a Gardasil product that Merck developed, uh, almost 4,000 deaths a year just in this country alone from cervical cancer. Uh, Merck has come up with a, uh, this, this vaccine uh, that young women and eventually I think young men uh, will be taking uh, to prevent, uh, in the case of women, um, uh, uh, cervical cancer uh, and, and, and really should uh, go a very long way to, to eliminating those 4,000 deaths in the country. Uh, and there are 160 medicines that are being developed for um, rare diseases. Um, I mentioned that, that not only is biotechnology about healing the world, but it's about fueling the world um, we've got a problem in this planet in, 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 with our, the size of our population as to whether we can actually continue to, to you know, uh, allow the planet to be inhabitable. Um, whatever you believe about uh, uh, global climate change and, 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 uh, and its causes, the fact of the matter is that um, the, the, the climate is changing. The fact of the matter is that we have to, for a variety of reasons, not just for uh, reasons of global warming, but as the United States, we have to become less reliant on on fossil fuels uh, from, from the Middle East and, and, and other places that are unstable. Uh, and we have to stop burning fossil fuels because they're, they're uh, very polluting to the air, uh, but uh, uh, greenhouse gases uh, uh, notwithstanding. Um, we also have um, a, a problem with, with plastic pollution in, in, in this planet. You know, it's, everybody runs around with these water bottles. I consume three or four of them today. They're all over the table here. Um, they're not very biodegradable. Uh, they end, uh, we, we think we recycle them. We don't recycle most of them around the world. And they're ending up in, in, uh, in the oceans and in, in, in all over the place. Um, an interesting book I read called The, uh, uh, the Eye of the Albatross. And it's, it, it's about a, it, it happens to be about the history of the albatross. The albatross is, a, is an unusual bird in that it, is, it hunts using its olfactory senses. And so the, the albatross will, uh, a pair will, will have a chick, and then the, the parents will take turns, and the, the parent will fly off and, and for maybe a 5,000 mile journey out across the ocean. And what it does is it skims along the surface of the ocean, and when it smells um, uh, fish eggs, 
that are attached you know, normally to little strands of seaweed and so forth. It comes along and scoops that up uh, and puts it in its gullet. And after this 5,000 mile journey, it comes back and it regurgitates uh, the contents of its gullet into the chick uh, to feed it. Uh, well, increasingly, um, what the fish eggs are attached to are little bottle caps, floating bottle caps, and other little pieces of plastic detritus. And so what happens is that all gets then uh, put into the <laughs> chick's gullet, and, uh, and the, 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 the shores of the islands where the albatross lives in Southwest Hawaiian Islands are covered with dead bodies of chicks whose, whose uh, intestines have been perpetrated, um, uh, have been penetrated uh, and perforated um, by uh, plastic. Um, so it's a, it's a little interesting story, but it, it tells us why we've got to figure out how to, among other things, make uh, biodegradable plastic. Now, um, some of our companies have figured out how to take the E. coli bacteria and bioengineer it so that it makes a plastic um, that uh, is completely <coughs> biodegradable. So you'll be able to take, and already um, there are companies that make these, these very bottles and make uh, plastic flatware and so forth that you can literally put your compost pile in a matter of weeks and it'll be gone. Now, a water soluble um, water bottle is probably not a good idea, um, <laughs> but one that is, that is soluble in salt water is probably a good idea um, to keep it uh, from polluting the oceans. Um, advanced biofuels, um, uh, there's been a debate about ethanol, and there's this is sort of false food versus fuel debate that's going on about whether by using so much ethanol from cornstarch uh, to produce fuel for our automobiles, are we there by removing that from the, um, from the food, feed and food uh, pathway, and thereby raising the price of those things and causing hunger. Um, we, we, uh, we look at, at, at ethanol from cornstarch, from the kernel of the corn, as an early form of biofuel. What we really want to get into is cellulosic uh, ethanol, where you can take the hard part of the, of the plant, whether it's the corn husk or, or the corn um, you know, stalk, or wood chips or switchgrass and convert that into sugar. That's very difficult to do because those structures evolve to be difficult to break down. So what we're able to do in, in some of our biotechnology companies are, are developing enzymes through recombinant DNA that can in fact break down the cellulose, turn it into sugar, which you can distill into ethanol. Uh, and we think that cellulosic ethanol will produce up to 60 billion gallons per year by the year 2030 and replace 30% of the projected US gasoline demand with dramatically reducing probably by a factor of 80% um, the amount of, of, um, of greenhouse gases that are emitted um, from the burning of that fuel. In Maryland, there's a company called Zymetis, which is spun out of, of the re uh, research at the University of Maryland at College Park. It's developing an enzyme developed from a bacterium isolated from Chesapeake Bay salt marsh grasses uh, that can be used uh, in this way. Um, and that's slide I should have had up when I was talking about that. Um, the other huge problem that we face as a planet, um, besides premature death and disease, death and, and suffering from disease, and the question of environmental sustainability, is whether or not, as I mentioned earlier, we're able to feed not only the 6 billion people on the planet now, but the 9 billion people that will soon be amongst us. 5 million children uh, below the ages of 5 years of age are suffering from malnutrition, and 16,000 children die of hunger every single day. Just came back from India, um, and there are an awful lot of hungry people in that part of the world. So feeding a population of, of 9.1 billion people in 2050 will require raising our overall food production by 70%. The reason that we're able to feed the 6 billion people who are here now is because of what we call the Green Revolution, uh, that uh, guys like Dr. Norman Borlaug um, innovated in, the, in, in past decades, um, but in order to feed the, 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 the next several billion people on our way, it's going to require a gene revolution, and that is ways of making our, our farmers more productive by altering the, the, the biology of plants. If you are a corn farmer uh, anywhere in the world, uh, one of your chief enemies is the root worm. Uh, the root worm lives in the soil, and when you plant your corn, the root worm goes in and bores into the roots of that corn uh, to feed, and that makes the corn less able to take uh, water and nutrition from the soil, uh, and eventually it weakens it so much that it can blow over in a, in a, in a storm. So 
Uh, corn farmers have historically had to use a vast amount of insecticide to try to kill this uh, little corn uh, worm borer. Uh, and when organic uh, farmers figured out that there's a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis that, um, that has the capacity to, when ingested, when this bacteria is ingested by the, by the um, boot uh, worm, it actually perforates its gut and it dies. And so organic farmers have been buying this bacteria and they spread it on their, on their crops. Well, what um, biotechnology companies like Monsanto and others figured out was how to take the, ge the, the genetic sequence of that, um, of that bacteria, that particular gene in the bacteria that has that effect, and they literally inserted it into the genome of corn. They use a gene gun, and they shoot it into embryonic uh, corn seeds. And um, when they get lucky, they get it right in the right place. And what's happened now is that um, for, for uh, a number of years now, we've had BT corn. We also have BT cotton and soy. And what that does is, uh, because that gene is now in, in the genome of the corn, when, that, uh, you, when the farmers use those seeds, and grow that corn, when that worm bites on the, the root of the corn, it dies. And there's no insecticide required to accomplish that. And nor, um, despite the, the, the protestations of some, nor is there any scientific basis to think, uh, and more, more evidence to show that there's any um, health uh, issues involved in, in doing that as well. So uh, again, biotechnology is going to, I think, be critical to our ability to, uh, to feed this world. 13, uh, more than 13 million farmers in 25 countries now are using biotech crops. Uh, planted on 309 million acres, and that's a growing number, and that is a, a good thing. And we have so much more to learn. We're just so uh, an announcement today. I think that um, there's a new uh, soybean um, that's going to have uh, omega-3 uh, in it. Um, that's it's going to soon be uh, seeking FDA approval. It's going to have a great boon to, uh, to, to human health as well. Um, all sorts of other cutting edge uh, research is being done in synthetic biology, the ability to actually create new life forms um, through synthetic biology, uh, drought resistant crops, um, uh, personal genome sequencing. We think we're going to come to the day where uh, it will be affordable for each one of us. The day will come probably in the not too distant future where when a child is born, its gene will be, uh, the genome will be sequenced there and then. Uh, the geneticists will, uh, counselors will come out to the parents and talk to them about what predispositions that child might have to certain diseases and how they might, as parents, through diet and a variety of other preventative methods, um, reduce the likelihood that, that their children will suffer from those diseases. Uh, RNA interfering gene silencing technologies, new uh, vaccines against cancer like Gardasil I mentioned. Patient-specific vaccines, we actually uh, personalize the vaccine to the patient, take measurements within the patient's body, and then come back and produce a, a personalized vaccine for that um, for that patient. That's, there's some applications of that already in prostate cancer. Tissue engineering, where we're able to create, actually literally create uh, new organs on scaffolds. Uh, gene therapy, uh, there was just a story of, a, you may have seen this, of a, a young boy who was born with a congenital defect that caused um, Blindness. I um, mean, he could barely see at all. Uh, and uh, an experiment done at the University of Pennsylvania uh, a, 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 a clinician from there at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia using gene therapy. Uh, this little boy uh, had his, his vision restored to the point where he could hit a baseball um, uh, and play, play him out in the backyard, which is pretty amazing. Regenerative medicine, the first. Um, uh, Geron, one of bio member companies, Geron in Menlo Park, California, is now involved in the, it has the approval from the FDA for the first ever human uh, stem cell um, uh, clinical trial. And this will be for uh, very severely injured spinal, spinally injured patients who have uh, become, um, uh, lost their ability uh, to move their legs using stem cells uh, to restore uh, function. It's already been done. In, uh, in rodents very, very effectively, and I think there's no reason why the science won't work in humans. And this is literally about people who, uh, as a result of automobile accidents, diving accidents, those kind of things, have had severe spinal injuries and will be able to uh, get out of their wheelchairs and walk again. Um, so, for those of you interested in, in 
this, these careers, as I said earlier, uh, I think there's, there's nothing more exciting than going into this field. Uh, and I think if, if, you, if you want to change the world, if you want to save the world, whether your passion is to prevent suffering from, from disease, suffering from hunger, you want to save the planet uh, in terms of our environmental concerns, biotechnology is a place to go. And it also uh, is, a, is, is a huge opportunity, an expanding opportunity, in a, in a particularly at a time when, when jobs, because of the worldwide economy, are scarce for new opportunities. So there are all these new and emerging jobs, um, cutting edge fields. Um, uh, a lot of these um, emerging jobs were not even um, in existence 10 years ago. So we're talking about biochemical engineering, bioinformatics scientists, bioinformatics <laughs> technicians. Won't read the list, but you can see um, that there is a long and growing list of careers uh, in, this, uh, in this field. Uh, nice thing is that they pay well, too, so you can do uh, well while you're doing good. Um, the average annual wage in life science is $71,000, and you can see um, from this slide that it, it uh, goes up from there. 68% uh, higher wages than the average private sector jobs. Um, uh, as I said, the science sector starts at about 71000 a year and goes up um, compared to $42,000 for an average uh, private sector job. Uh, the economic, economic uh, the employment growth projections are good. Uh, it's expected that um, the industry is scientific research and development and technical service industry is going to grow by 9.4%. Uh, over the course of the next six years, 23.7% um, in pharmaceutical and medical manufacturing. You see um, robust growth in all of these other um, uh, uh, career opportunities. Um, there are many paths to a biotech uh, career. Um, they're not, um, don't have to necessarily uh, work for a, a research company, although here's an example. Uh, Vertex, a company, an uh, interesting company in, in Boston, uh, typically have over 200 job openings at Vertex at any one time. Um, they've got lots of scientific positions, but we also need people in accounting, mathematics, project management, quality assurance, legal human resources, information technology, public policy, procurement, and logistics, and medical writing. So it's, it's a very broad field, all kinds of opportunities that exist. And they don't necessarily all happen to be in, in research companies or careers in research uh, R&D companies but in administration, in teaching, in sales and marketing, uh, in patent law, in government regulatory affairs, in technical writing, and in the, the healthcare uh, sphere generally. Um, I want to tell you about a career fair if you're interested in the career of biotechnology. Uh, I mentioned our annual event. It will be in, in uh, Chicago this year. And we're doing a career fair, but you don't have to um, be there uh, in order to participate. It's going to be Monday, May 3rd. Um, but you uh, can register and upload your resume uh, at our website and, um, uh, and participate in the job career, job fair in that way. Um, it's going to take place at our annual uh, convention in Chicago. Our theme this year is, is fulfilling the, pro uh, the promise. Uh, we'll have hopefully 20,000 people there. I would like you to come. It's, it's the Olympics, the Worldwide Olympics of Biotechnology. It's a fascinating place to be. Uh, this year we've uh, signed up Al Gore to be one of our speakers. He's going to talk obviously about global warming and, uh, and the biotechnology solutions to global warming. Uh, and we just announced a couple days ago that we're going to have uh, a, a, a lightweight panel discussion uh, with Bill Clinton and George W. Bush on stage together. And um, I get to, to moderate that conversation, which will be interesting. I served with both of them when I was in Congress. And, I'm tempted to have as my first question something like, so I bet you guys never thought you'd be working for me. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating time, and there'll be a fascinating discussion, and I encourage you to uh, come out and join us. Um, uh, those of you who uh, stopped at the I Am Biotech uh, table and got your free t-shirt and so forth, um, I encourage you to go to this website. One of the things that we're trying to do at Bio uh, in order to advance the public policy agenda is to, is, is to significantly uh, improve the, the perception of biotechnology among the public. Most people don't know what biotechnology is, uh, and there are lots of, of, of negative um, mythology surrounding biotechnology, so we're trying to counter that. We're trying to build up uh, consciousness about the positive aspects of biotechnology. We thought the logical place to do that would be 
with the men and women who work in biotechnology companies because uh, if we can't get the people who actually work in the field to be enthusiastic about public policy and talk to their members of Congress about it, then who can we get to do it? So we've created this website really initially uh, designed for people who are in uh, the companies in the field uh, to come and share their stories and uh, communicate with each other and understand the policy issues, issues that we're confronting uh, and become um, active as a result of that. So I encourage you to, uh, to go and do that. Um, quote from Ben Franklin, investment in knowledge is always, always pays the best interest. And that's what's going on here in, in a really pretty spectacular way. And I encourage you uh, to think about investing in knowledge about biotechnology and invest in yourself. Um, and I know that biotechnology um, will pay excellent interest to you, as Ben Franklin said. So to, uh, to conclude, um, I, I left Congress because I was convinced, um, as I said in the beginning, that we can heal, fuel, and feed the world through biotechnology. I don't think there's any other place that I would rather be. I can't imagine any place that's going to be more exciting and more fulfilling uh, in, the, in the decades to come than this field. It really is where the, the excitement is going to be. It really is where the challenges are going to be. Um, the growth in learning is exponential. Um, it is a worldwide enterprise. Uh, we're learning from each other globally, uh, and, uh, and the world's going to be a better place for that. So I commend you uh, to, uh, to uh, consider this as a lifelong career, and, um, and thank you for, uh, for being here. And I think I'd be happy to take your questions now. Thank you. for your inspiration and, and showing us so many opportunities and career options in biotechnology. I, I was glad to see biochemical engineering was your first option. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an engineer, so... <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, we're going to move on to uh, some question and answer uh, session. I should mention that the, um, this program is actually, the presentation is being, uh, we are doing our tweeting. Uh, and so we are collecting uh, questions, and uh, we hope that we'll find time uh, for Jim and I to have some podcasts so we can answer those questions. So, so, um, so we're going to move on to the, to the questions, and uh, uh, we actually have uh, three individuals that we're going to uh, start us off, um, and uh, we'll start with a question from a high school student. Could you please introduce yourself and uh, pose your question? Oh, I thought he was a high school student. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I read you. I read you. And I was wondering why should um, teenagers um, be involved in the biotech industry? Okay. Um, the question is, is why should teenagers uh, be interested in biotechnology and how can they be innovators in the field? Well, I think it goes to, to basically what I've been saying. And, you know, I, I think um, it's interesting. I'm a, I'm a baby boomer. Uh, I went to college between 1969 and 1973. It was a tumultuous time. The Vietnam War was going on. There was a lot going on in, in terms of, um, uh, of the whole civil rights movement, women's is issues, environmental concerns. Earth Day was created during that period. Uh, and I think it was because uh, it was because we, when we were teenagers, and actually I was a teenager, um, you know, we were worried about the future of the world, and that's why so many of us went into public service of one kind or another. Um, and I think that there's some parallels right now with the wars that are going on, with concerns about global warming. That I think we're seeing a lot of that, um, that that anxiety among young people about what the world's going to be a place that they want to you know, raise children in, um, and also a concomitant de de dedication to wanting to do something about it. So, um, as I said, I think if you look around the world. Uh, I'm not sure that biotechnology has the, has the answer to war, um, except to the extent that war is fought over resources. Um, but, um, but certainly, if you look at the amount of human suffering that goes on in this planet from disease, uh, if you look at, at the problems of feeding this planet, if you look at the problems of, of, of global warming and other environmental issues, I think the, the answers, as I mentioned, are all in global technology. And I think if I were a young person like you and and um, wanted to do something about that. I can't think of a better place to, to go. Um, how do you be innovators? I think it's, it's, it's about thinking outside of the box. It's about taking risks. It's about um, uh, being entrepreneurial. Uh, it's about um, uh, 
uh, asking questions that uh, no one has the answer to yet and committing yourself to finding those answers. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm uh, Tony Lubinecki from Senate Corps R&D. Uh, about every five years in this country, we uh, uh, have a, a renegotiation of the uh, Prescription Drug User Fee Act among uh, Congress, the FDA, and the industry. And of course, your organization plays a, a major role in helping to lead those renegotiations. As I understand it, we're about ready to go into another cycle, so I was wondering if you could share with us what some of your goals might be for this sure. next round. Sure. So for the uninitiated, uh, the, 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 there's a thing called PDUFA, which is the Pharmaceutical Drug User Fee Act. And um, uh, without getting too far into the weeds, the, the Food and Drug Administration, um, which I think is represented here tonight, um, has the, is the federal uh, agency whose job it is to take applications from, among others, drug companies um, who do clinical trials on their products and bring the data, and then the Food and Drug Agency has to, uh, Food and Drug Agency has to, administration has to determine whether those products are safe and whether they are effective. If they are demonstrated to be safe and effective, then they approve them so that they can be sold uh, to the public. Uh, many years ago, back in the early 80s, the, the drug discovery industry was concerned because it appeared that the the FDA did not have enough employees to do that job. And so here you have people dying of terrible diseases, uh, and you have companies that have developed uh, what they think is, is treatments and cures for those diseases, and they go into the FDA and they got bogged down because it would take forever for uh, the personnel there to get around and reviewing all of that complicated data and making a decision. So the, the, um, the industry said, look, charge us a fee. Every time you bring an application to the FDA, charge us a fee. It could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. If it's worth it to us, use that fee, hire enough people, qualified people to review our applications so we can effectively and efficiently get this review process accomplished. So that's called the Pharmaceutical Drug User Fee Act. Uh, it comes up for renewal, as the questioner said, every five years. And then when that happens, organizations like BIO negotiate with the FDA to see if we can come up with a bill that we can get the Congress to pass that will advance um, what we're trying to do. So this year, what we we're going to focus on this this round. We're going to focus on a couple of things. One of them is first-time filers. You have a lot of you have, if you're if you're Pfizer, if you're Merck, if you're GSK, you're a big pharmaceutical company. You've been down this road many times. You have quality. You have tons of people who know how to put together an application to the FDA. They know how to go through the process. But if you're an emerging company, most of the members of Bio are small companies who have not yet uh, had their first product. They're going to the FDA for the first time. Uh, and they have a dickens of a time because this is their first time. So one of the things we're trying to get the FDA to do is to be um, more helpful, more transparent with the, with the small companies. The other thing we're working on uh, has to do with, with um, safety issues. Um, some of you probably noticed that in the last several years we had issues with uh, drugs like Vioxx um, that uh, appeared to, cre to um, uh, increase um, uh, heart uh, problems. Uh, antidepressants that were causing suicide and suicide ideation among young people. There are a, number, there are a series of drugs that, that have been approved by the FDA were out in the, in the marketplace. They were being consumed and they were discovering these adverse effects uh, later on in the day. Uh, what that caused the Congress to do is to sort of beat up the FDA, beat up the drug companies and saying, why is this happening? Uh, we thought drugs were supposed to be 100% safe and, and all of the time. There's no such thing as a drug that's 100% safe all of the time. So the question <laughs> came to be, how do, we, how, do we, how do we get these drugs approved uh, so we can get them to patients sooner rather than later, uh, but also make sure that they're as safe as can be and not let the safety thing hold us, prevent us from actually approving these drugs. So what we've developed is what we call uh, 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 two systems. One is a routine uh, active monitoring system where we're actually trying to what we're trying to do in order to enhance safety is, is collect data. There are all kinds of ways to collect this data. When you take a prescribing data, you look at all of the, the drugs that have been prescribed to individuals, and then you look at treatment data. You look at those same individuals to see for what have they been treated for at hospitals and doctor's offices. And you correlate the two and you say, oh, look, it looks like this particular cohort of people is taking this drug and they're having this particular liver function. So we can see in a post-market uh, environment where these adverse effects are coming, see it in real time using computer technology uh, so that we can identify the, the 
particular individuals uh, or classes of individuals that are experiencing safety concerns. So that's another thing that we're going to try to improve the administration of that process um, in the, in the through the negotiations. Very detailed response, but uh, detailed question. Yes, ma'am. Um, Kathy Lee from the Food and Drug Administration. One, one of the many overworked, underpaid, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, my question is related to um, nanotechnology and biotechnology and the regulatory and scientific challenges you see moving forward because nanotech is an emerging technology and biotech now is more of a mature technology, but how those two are going to be married together and what do you, what do you see some of the challenges for that in the yeah. future? Well, I think from FDA's point of view, um, the, the, the basic issue is going to be the same in that your job is going to be, continue to be, is this product, is the, is the data collected by the company using a combination of nanotechnology and biotechnology techniques in the same product? Is the product safe and is the product effective? That's going to be a fundamental question. The challenge, I think, will really be in the personnel involved um, because what we need is, is more overworked and underpaid folks at the FDA. Um, but it's a, it's, a serious, it's a serious question. One of the things that Bio has done uh, is we, we work very hard to improve, to dramatically increase the appropriations that Congress makes to the FDA. Because we've gone and said, and this is sort of unusual for a regulated industry, we've said we want our regulator to have more funds, more people, to do the job better because, it's because that enables them to review our applications. And so, um, number one, we've gone to the, to the Congress and successfully gotten a significant increase in appropriations. We think what, you, what, what the FDA needs is, you know, that if, if, if all of these smart people that this university and others are producing, they go out into the, into the private sector, produce these miracle products um, using this state-of-the-art science, and then they take them to the FDA, and the FDA reviewers are going like, what's this? Um, it's not going to work. So the FDA has to be populated by people who are just as smart uh, and just as knowledgeable and just up to speed on the science as the people in the private sector. And frankly, you have to pay them well, or they're going to all be in the private sector. And that's, you know, um, public service is a wonderful thing to dedicate yourself to, and thank you for doing it. Uh, but you know as well as I do, you can make more money going out in the private sector. Um, and so I think we've got to, we've got to you know, face up to that and, and pay well enough to get you know, smart people like yourself there. Hi there. So my name is Andrea Rivera. I'm a PhD student at the Chemical and My Chemical Engineering Department. So I'm interested on clinical trials and how hard it is sometimes to approve those. So you just mentioned that the first clinical trial with embryonic stem cells is taking place right now in California. So I came from the World Stem Cell Summit uh, that took place in Maryland two months ago. And as you can imagine, there were talks and talks about the political issues and bureaucratic issues that they had to face to get this first clinical trial approved. And also to lift the ban on uh, stem cell research. So. Since you were a member from Congress, I was interested on in your opinion on what kind of political challenges for science development do you think that we'll be facing, not only on healthcare, but also regarding, for example, alternative energies on a society that is so dependent on oil. You know what I'm saying? So science is already hard enough. So. Repeat the last you said, not only with clinical trials, but what else? Not only regarding healthcare, but for example, uh, regarding alternative energies, you talked about ethanol. Uh, on a society that is so dependent on oil. So, so you asking what the political challenges are? Yes. Well, the political challenges are vast. Um, I mean, for, first off, um, when, when you... Uh, an interesting phenomena is that the, the drug discovery enterprise um, has done more to... Uh, and has done as much as any sector in the, in the country to reduce human suffering and extend lives and you know everyone loves to know that, that, that there's a miracle drug for their loved ones and so forth. And yet the drug industry is pretty much um, uh, despised um, by politicians and, and the public and so we have to sort of address that issue. Why is that the case? I think part of the reason is um, the, 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 the Medicare system that was created in the 1960s by LBJ and others um, provided hospitalization coverage for seniors and the disabled and provided physician coverage, but it didn't provide prescription drug benefits. And so what happened is, my father's a perfect example of this. Uh, he, he 77 years old, he has triple bypass surgery, 
Uh, he goes to the hospital. He, he probably has hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of hospital bills covered entirely by his Medicare plus his Medicare gap insurance. He has all these probably fifty thousand dollars worth of doctors' bills all paid for um, by uh, uh, the Medicare. And on the way out of the hospital, they give him a prescription, and he goes to the drugstore, and they want a hundred bucks. And he feels he's like somebody's ripping me off here. And um, and because prior to the creation of the, of the prescription drug benefit, um, the, the biggest out-of-pocket payment for seniors was drugs. And so they just assumed that somehow, and plus, seniors who were born in the Depression would shake a bottle of pills and say, this can't be $200 worth of medicine in this thing, because they, they can't quite see all of the R&D that went into it. So there was this sense that the drug companies were, were ripping the, the, the patients off. So. Um, by, by creating the prescription drug benefit, we try to alleviate that problem so seniors don't have that out-of-pocket expense. But the average member of Congress has no idea how a drug is, is, is produced. Um, they think that the NIH um, produces drugs, the NIH doesn't produce drugs. Um, you can get a laugh here, but you won't get that laugh in Congress. Um, you know, and it, it, it's interesting, President Obama, is, as smart as he is, in his first address joint, to a joint session of Congress, among other things, said, he wanted to cure a cancer in our lifetime. And then he said, and that's why I'm going to you know, increase dramatically the funding for the NIH. Well, that's, that's an important component. But the fact of the matter is that the NIH produces um, grants that produce really high quality academic papers. And then that knowledge has to be taken out by spin-off companies, small biotech companies, medium-sized biotech companies, big pharma, and they've got to take, they've got to attract all this capital to all this at-risk capital uh, to fund what is now about a, a billion dollars plus to, to, to get a drug to market. Uh, and, uh, and we've got to have a, a government that, that nurtures that, that, um, that enterprise rather than impedes it. And if you look at this healthcare debate, uh, what you see is the Congress say, okay, drug industry, we want $100 billion from you, and we want you to cut your prices here and cut your prices there and to, in order to pay for this, for this uh, health care reform. Well, and as I said earlier, if you do that, um, you're going to kill the drug enterprise. Um, so it, it's a matter of, of educating members of Congress. I spend a lot of time on the Hill trying to explain to members of Congress you know, what intellectual property is all about, what uh, venture capital is all about, what the FDA is all about, um, what pricing is all about, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very a challenging uh, process, but we're, make, we're making uh, significant progress. Um, similarly, on the, on the, on the, the questioner talked about the fuels issue. Um, there is this, this, this false um, political battle going on uh, on this, this alleged fuel versus fuel, feed versus fuel debate, as I mentioned earlier. I actually went, I was in South Dakota not long ago to a company called Poet, uh, and they are an ethanol, they're a starch ethanol producer. And I watched, stood at the plant, and I watched uh, farmers come in with their tractor trailers full of corn kernels. Uh, they dump the corn kernels off, they go into a pulverizer, and they, were, and they go into the process to make ethanol. There are two train tracks that leave this plant. One of them has uh, tankers, tanker cars, uh, in which the fittest ethanol is, is, is um, put and transported away. The other are hopper cars, into which the protein that's been extracted from this, this, this corn goes off to chicken and cow farms, hog farms. And so it wasn't just a question of food versus fuel. Here we're getting feed and fuel from the same product. Um, but that's another political challenge, because there are those who are opposed to um, there's a whole group of people who are opposed to what they call industrial farming and think that life would be nice if we all had an acre that we could get up in the morning and, and hoe. Um, <laughs> and that would be nice, but I don't think we're going to feed 9 million people that way. Hi, just following along with that question um, regarding public opinion and facts. Um, one of my pet peeves is the misinformation that gets spread. And about 15 years ago at a science meeting, uh, Leroy Hood gave a very inspirational talk about science and futures in science. And I asked the question then, what is it that scientists can do to help counteract erroneous information in the media? Now, 15 years ago, we didn't have nearly the media that we have now. And I've seen things get only worse, not better. So I'm thrilled to see that you have the IM Biotech um, organization that's moving forward, but in your opinion, from your experiences 
in Congress, now in bio. What do you believe bio or UMBC or scientists such as myself who work in the field or students who are coming up in the field, what can we do to better communicate facts to the public so that we can maybe get people not to be freaked out about gene modified food products or vaccines that potentially cause autism, although every piece of data shows they don't? Well, um, I would say it's, it's it, on, a, on a regular basis, it's pretty hard for individual scientists, scientists to do a lot of communicating to the public at large. Um, that's one of the things that we're doing. So we, we not only do we have our, our, our various websites that are doing that, um, we, uh, I, we do what we call satellite media tours. I'll, I'll, we'll take a hook like uh, National Cancer Month, and then we'll, uh, I'll take a, a woman uh, who's an eight-year survivor of breast cancer, thanks to her septin, and we'll, we'll sit in the studio and we'll do uh, 30 or 40 television shows in a row around the country talking about um, bio, biotechnology and, and how it applies to people's lives. And we're, we're doing all kinds of things in the print media. Um, we're trying, we're, there's going to be a, a new television show uh, on, in the Washington area. That, if you get WUSA up here today, um, on Sunday mornings we're working, we're negotiating now to have a, a right before Face the Nation, a half an hour show on biotechnology every morning. Um, which, in which will bring leadership leaders from the from the field, members of Congress, and others to come and, and talk about the issue in interesting ways. So we're doing a lot, but, but the thing is, as individuals, are, uh, I would ask for a show of hands. How many of you, if I call on you, would be able to tell me uh, the name of your United States Congressperson? And I'm going to call on you, so don't put your hand up because you really it. Oh, uh, look at the hands come down. <laughs> but point being, most of you don't. Most of you don't. And so, um, you know, I'll give you my little Pollyanna speech as someone who ran for elective office for 24 years. You know, you live in the greatest country in the world, at least as it pertains to the openness of our democracy. There's very few places on earth, and not, it's certainly not in Europe, where you can just pick up the phone and call your member of Congress, ask for a meeting, and get it. Uh, walk into their office and get it. Uh, most people don't think that, but the fact of the matter is, if you call your congressional, your congressman's office and say, "I'd like to meet," you're probably going to get that meeting, uh, and it's something you ought to do, um, uh, and, and you ought to take advantage of you, or just pick up that you see your, your, you see an issue going along, you think you're, you you have some expertise that your congressman doesn't. Uh, pick up the phone and say, "Hey, I, you know, I've been watching this debate about." GMOs, or from watching this debate about such and such, and I just thought you ought to know as someone in your, someone in your district is a scientist and understands this thing, and I'd like to spend ten minutes on the phone with you. Just do it. Uh, it's 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 um, it, it's easy, and it's a it's almost a responsibility. Just so that might solve the problem in the United States, but there are other places in the world where the uh, objections of uh, genetically modified food and, and any other kind of modification of living organisms is uh, it's much stronger, you know, to the point of white writing. Well, so particularly, we're... yeah, particularly in Europe, um, they've never um, uh, they struggled with this whole issue of, of, of genetically modified organisms. Um, genetically enhanced crops. Um, part of it is because um, there are a lot of reasons. There's there's protectionism um, from the from the agricultural uh, interests in Europe. Um, there is uh, the, the green politics, which is stronger in Europe, and so the politicians are t more inclined to sort of kowtow to the to the greens there. Uh, issues like mad cow disease cause the Europeans to have the, uh, to have a lot of mistrust in their uh, regulatory uh, agencies. One of the things that I, that I hold hope out, though, is this: the Europeans are very keen on global warming issues. I mean, almost across the board, uh, they, they're very uh, critical of the United States for not <coughs> signing on to the Kyoto Protocols and so forth. And next week, it's all going to take place over again in Copenhagen, and again, we, the United States won't be, won't be quite ready for that. Um, so, so. I think as we as we look at solutions to um, global warming, and we look at, uh, as I mentioned, for instance, cellulosic ethanol as an alternative, and then you see that the, the next step, if you're going to if you're going to use switchgrass and other uh, biomass to create uh, cellulosic ethanol, um, you're going to probably 
need to do some genetic modification of those plants so that they can grow more densely, so that they can be better sources of fuel. And I'm hoping that as the, um, as the, as the Europeans, for instance, see that a good solution to global warming is to genetically modify plants so they can better sources of biomass, that they might, um, uh, that might be a, a sort of a backdoor way into, into things. The other thing is the Europeans basically have this, 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 this policy of, uh, of the uncertainty principle that it's sort of everything is guilty until proven innocent. And so they're basically saying, well, it's true that Americans have been eating these you know, foods from genetically modified crops, and yes, we see no evidence, but we can't prove yet that there will never be a problem. Um, and I think to some extent over time, uh, the Europeans are going to have to look at this and say, look, there just isn't anything going wrong uh, with people who are consuming products made from BT corn. Yes? Yes, uh, my name's uh, Bill Gaskins, and I'm with the Baltimore Office of International Affairs. So I'd like to build off of this gentleman's question. And I was wondering if you could speak to how international exchanges, partnerships, might benefit innovation and policy. You know, if we were to join with other nations and how we could reach across and maybe uh, advance, uh, make better advances in innovation and, and, and especially in policy changes. Mm -hmm. Well, on, uh, the, the, I guess on the science side, it seems to me um, that the globe has shrunk to such a point because of the internet and, and, and the virtual way that we do everything. The scientists in Korea and India and China and Europe and the Americas are pretty much able to communicate online in a variety of other ways. So I think there's a tremendous exchange of information that's going on that is, that is um, Causing an exponential growth in the, in the knowledge about biotechnology, even without without policymakers doing anything about it. On the policy front, one of the things that we're doing is there are there are agents, there are organizations like ours, none of them nearly as big and as um, well um, resourced as we are, but there are agents. There are there's a bio Europe and there's there are in individual countries in Europe and, and elsewhere uh, around the world. Um, there are those organizations. I made a point to meet with them twice a year, uh, once at our annual meeting and then uh, some, once in Europe. And so that when we have a policy issue that we want to advocate that we have to do with GMOs, we might have to do with intellectual property protection and so forth, we're now being able to put together communications from all of us so that these multilateral organizations will get a letter from that might be signed by 15 different biotech associations globally uh, that has a lot more clout than if it's just the U.S. Uh, doing it. The other thing we do is we do partnering meetings around the world. So not only do we have our partnering meeting, uh, uh, partnering meetings in the U.S., but we do two a year in Europe. We do one uh, a year in Japan. I just came back, as I mentioned, from India because we're going to start doing one there in September. Whereas in the last year I was in China, we start doing one in China every year. And that is a, a tremendous way to um, bring people together from around the planet and to, and for, and create huge efficiencies where. American companies can sit down with Chinese companies and say, okay, we do this really well, you do that really well, but you do that really inexpensively, um, how do we collaborate? And so I think you're going to get tremendous global synergy as a result of those kinds of meetings. Okay. Um, people are with the FDA, and I have a question. You sort of draw a parallel comparison between the um, IT industry and, uh, and biotech. Um, so I, I would kind of say we're probably right now in biotech, probably in the area of around the 80s. Those who remember the 80s, we had um, lots of types of computers. We had, um, you know, if you had a gigabyte of, uh, nobody even thought of gigabytes back then. Um, but now where we are today, we have you know, the internet, we have you can, you can put your whole genome on a chip in your pocket without trouble at all. What is it that we need? And I guess maybe you say as well, we seem to be, products are coming off the in, in the market relatively slowly and have been for quite some time. What do we need to kick us into that exponential growth, get us on to Moore's law plot and uh, move us ahead so that we're really putting out multiple products quicker and quicker and what should students be thinking about in terms of, say, 10, 20 years from yeah. now? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, yeah, the, I, I probably demonstrate my bias here, but 
information technology is easier than biotechnology. It just is. Um, what's that? But it doesn't grow. It's not a lot. Right. Um, the, the, uh, you know, it, it, when the human genome was sequenced around the year 2000, there was this, um, this expectation that, okay, now we've got the whole gene se sequence, uh, genome sequence, now we're just going to say, okay, so that's the gene that produces Parkinson's disease, now we'll cure Parkinson's, and there was a, the single gene theory about every disease, and so what happened as a result of that, there was this huge uh, burst in investment, you know, it was like the dot-com uh, period, where if you had something that sounded like gene in your name, people would throw millions of dollars at you because they thought they were going to make a fortune. Uh, as it turns out, diseases are more complicated than that. And it turns out that there aren't that many diseases that are caused by a simple, like one simple genetic mechanism, but it's usually, we have a proclivity to diseases because we might have six or seven genetic things going on with us that causes that enhanced rate of proclivity. And so it's much more complicated than we thought it was going to be to, to do this. Um, having said that, I, 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 um, I think that the, the, the growth is going to eventually become uh, like Moore's Law. There's going to be this sort of asymptotic growth in, in our capacity here. I just think there, there's sort of a tipping point that, that's going to have to be reached in the knowledge. Um, and, and I think we also have to sort of um, rethink some of the ways that the FDA functions, and, and not, not to put it on the FDA, but, but uh, like for instance, using biomarkers. Uh, so that you can, um, uh, rather than have clinical trials in which you have to wait until the entire course of the drug is complete and you get the end and final result of how the patient uh, performs, um, be able to, to find subtle biomarkers that show that there's an increase in production of this protein or something, and that should be, um, in many cases, sufficient to approve the drug um, uh, and, and, and accelerate the clinical trial process. I think we have to, there's a lot that has to be rethought about how we do clinical trials. Um, but there's also a lot of work that has to be done in the, uh, on the science side that just isn't quite done yet. We have time for one more question. <clears throat> or maybe two, the guy in the yellow shirt. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Frank Gimano. I've spent a lifetime in computer software with parallel interest. Oh, the easy stuff. In yeah. <laughs> but I just want to before I ask my question, yes, you've got a much harder problem. Than that. <laughs> Thousands of many diseases, many tissue types, many approaches, all emerging technology. It's orders of magnitude more difficult. I commend all of you who live in that world. You had a much, much harder time of it than, than we had. So my question is That's very gracious of you, thank you. Yeah. As you know, it takes a billion dollars and ten plus years to get a drug out. Uh, and because of our patent laws, the companies only have six to ten years to make all that money back and then start showing a profit. Right. Do you think there's any merit in the, in the pharmaceutical industry to extend the patent laws to give the companies more time to make their money back, knowing full well that the key objection is, oh, they're just going to put the money in their pockets. Right. How do you counter that? Right. So um, we're, we're, we're fighting this battle. Uh, it's a royal battle that's, that's been brewing on, on um, but the bio, biologics they should follow on biologics. So, if you if in the small molecule world, the pharmaceutical world, uh, back in the early 1980s, uh, Hatch-Waxman was passed, and Hatch-Waxman sets up a process by which a generic company can um, uh, all they have to do is demonstrate that they can make the same molecule, and because the molecule can be it's precisely a generic is by definition the exact same molecule, there's no logical need for that company to repeat. The, the clinical trials that demonstrate safety and efficacy because all you have to do is basically show that they can make the same molecule and dose it into people in, in, in a reasonable way. Uh, and so uh, Hatch-Waxman was created, uh, uh, and what Hatch-Waxman says is you get your patent, um, you, uh, you get to extend your patent. You, uh, for every day that you're in clinical trials, you get to add a half day to your, your patent life, and for every day your patent is pending, or your application is pending at the FDA, get to add a full day. So when all that is, expires, then the FDA can approve a drug of a generic company uh, in an accelerated way, relying on the data of the, of the um, innovator. And it works pretty well. There's still a pretty good incentive to make that billion dollar investment, and there's still a pretty good incentive for the generic companies to get in. And, and frankly, the payers and the consumers benefit as a result of that competition. Biologics, 
biologics being, for those of you who don't know, large, vastly more complicated uh, proteins made inside of living cells. Um, there is no such pathway. It's a, new, it's a newer technology, and so Congress is trying to create a statutory pathway so that generics can come in and make uh, what we call biosimilars. That, um, and I said, this is a small molecule, a DVD player with a molecule of EPO in it. This is a biologic. This is how you make this one. This is how you make this one. Explain the whole thing. Uh, we had fierce battles in the committees, and, and we, 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 went, we backed down from 14 to 12 years of data exclusivity. But we won in the, in the Senate committee, 16 to 7, and we won in the Energy and Commerce Committee, 47 to 11, against the chairman's wishes. So we're very effective in getting that. So we, and we think that in the healthcare, this is going to be wrapped into the health care bill that will end up with 12 years of data exclusivity, which we think will be sufficient to continue to uh, uh, you know, maintain the incentives for investment in, bio, in biologics. I think it would be very difficult for us to go back to the Congress and ask for a for attraction to be altered to give us a longer period of time. I think it makes all the sense in the world. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, and the argument that I keep using with these members of Congress is, look, uh, here's what we know. No, there's no debate about this. The longer the patent life, the more investment dollars you'll, you'll attract into the enterprise. The shorter the patent life, or the shorter the period of, of exclusivity, um, the sooner you get competition into the marketplace. So it's a question of balancing off cost savings against innovation. And, and uh, uh, sorry to make this answer a little bit long, but what I keep saying to members of Congress is, you see the baby boom generation coming at you, you see dragons on the horizon, and you think that these dragons are going to consume the health care budget of the United States, in fact, the entire budget of the United States. And you think that's what's written on the, on the chest of those dragons are hospital costs, doctor costs, and drug costs. As those dragons get closer, you're going to see what it really says is cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer. And those are the dragons that are going to consume uh, the budget. And we're the industry that can slay those dragons if we don't slay us first. So, um, so the real way to get healthcare costs down is to reduce the incidence of chronic disease. And the way to do that is with these new miracle drug products. And that's only going to happen if, you, if the incentives are there for us. All right, last question. I'm actually an alumni of the school, and I'm in the School of Pharmacy now in Maryland. Sure. Um, uh, I was really interested in your presentation uh, on uh, medicine and agriculture and uh, uh, fuel. Um, uh, I'm, uh, my, my question is um, about ethical concerns. Um, to what, uh, if any, um, ethical challenges has bio faced, and um, what actions have they taken to address any challenges that they've had? Well, there, there, there are a number of ethical questions. I'll, I'll say two things. Um, first, ethics as it comes to advocacy. Um, I told when I applied for this job, and the, uh, the board asked me how we're going to be effective in advocacy, I said, there are three secrets to being effective advocates, and they all lean forward, and I said, the truth, the truth, and the truth. And I said, I will never work for you unless that's what you want, um, because that's the only thing that I'm willing to do, and that's the only thing that works. And, and so we, we are, um, we are uh, uh, absolutely uh, scrupulous when it comes to making sure that we never give information to members of Congress or to anyone else that is absolutely accurate balance, and we tell them what the countervailing arguments are. More, much more broadly, there are a host of issues uh, uh, that uh, involve ethics, everything from clinical trials uh, to access to health care um, uh, to, um, well, this is a, a vast, vast range of the, the ethical questions about uh, genetically modifying plants and animals and so forth. We have a, a I've created a board level ethics committee at BIO, and so we, we have that committee meets regularly, we take up challenges, and we make sure that we, we think that our job is to confront these ethical issues before the Congress even thinks of them, so that we can self-regulate as an industry and prevent anything from happening that would um, have, have kind of consequences that would set the industry back, because I think, that, as I've said over and over again, the, the, the promise of this industry is too spectacular, too important, too crucial to the survival of, of, the, of our species and this planet. Uh, to allow ethical lapses, uh, advert, inadvertent or, or otherwise, uh, to set us back. Thank you so much for your attention. I've enjoyed being here.
Congressman, thank you so much for spending your evening with us and for making tonight's event again another great evening for biotechnology at the UMBC. Uh, we have a small gift for you. So, just a small token of our appreciation again for taking the time. The UMBC cheerleading outfit. <laughs> <laughs> say that I would, I would wear this when I'm uh, doing the Clinton Bush thing, but I, I <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 In the Division of Continuing Professional Studies, for a terrific job in putting tonight's event together and taking care of all the media details that were involved in the program. They're all sitting in the back, uh, primarily, and uh, Chris Morris is also here up front. Uh, again, thank you so much for all that you have done for tonight's event. I also would like to recognize Dr. Rick Wolf, who is also sitting in, in the back. Uh, Rick is the, uh, the director of uh, our biotechnology uh, MBS program. Again, he's been a terrific leader uh, for you know, all these years and uh, a great advocate for the program. And if you have any questions, any, any, anything you'd like to know about the various uh, UMBC biotech programs, please stop by my, my Dr. Wolf. He will be more than glad to give you the information and to, uh, to, again, to guide you to write the uh, flyers or websites so that you can uh, look in more detail of what we offer here at UNBC. I'd like to again remind you to turn in your evaluations and uh, to receive your, uh, your grocery bag, very important. Uh, also, this event uh, not only is being tweeted, but is also being taped. And uh, I believe it will be available uh, on the website uh, within a, a few days, and uh, so you can again recover or, or review everything that was uh, discuss tonight uh, and share also with your, uh, uh, your friends and, and colleagues and talk about the programs. I uh, also want you to make sure that you mark your calendars for our spring biotech information session. That will be on March 25th and also there is a website that you can get more information about the program in spring. Uh, again, thank you so much all of you for coming tonight, uh, being part of the program uh, for great questions. Uh, and uh, before you leave, I invite you all to again look at the information on the tables also. Uh, network further, we still have food left, I believe, so uh, uh, many of us have been cooking all night. So, <laughs> so uh, we don't want to see any leftovers for tomorrow. So uh, again, continue to enjoy the refreshments, the network. Thank you so much for coming and uh, hope to see you soon at another event. Thank you again. Thank you.